We love to identify something as a sacred value, sacred object, like a rock or a tree. Traditional religions would make a person or a river, something is sacred. And then we circle around it, we worship it, we make sacrifices to it. And that's the way religions have always worked. Well, now that reli formal religions are fading out, but we have these, these sort of new or moralistic religions. And so, you know, fighting racism, very good cause. Well, when fighting racism becomes the center of a religious cult, you get all these extreme policies. And this is what universities have been for several decades. They've been basically cults devoted to fighting racism. Now that, again, a good aim, but it has been warping research. Right, so the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Exactly, so then, so, so just go with me here. We got like this like 40, 50 year thing about racism. Okay, so then we have this like 20 year thing about gay rights and gay marriage. And everybody in universities is totally in favor of gay rights, gay marriage. That's been true for decades. And it's the most amazing thing that in American society, just in about 20 years, we go from like, no way, never, to, you know, wow, okay, I guess it's the law of the land and most people accept it. So 20 years, that's amazing. Okay, but now what's weird is three years ago, nobody knew a transgender person. Nobody thought about it. It, it, it did, wasn't on anybody's radar. Mm -hmm. So to make it in three years from that to you must do this, this I think is a bridge too far. And this I think is... I think Obama is gonna be remembered for this. I think it's gonna cause a lot of reaction because the, the country was not ready for this and it's not appropriate for the federal government. I can see why the Supreme Court would weigh in on marriage rights because marriage has to be coordinated among the states. I get that. Bathrooms, the federal government bathrooms, like, you know, had, had, did, did nobody read the Federalist Papers? Has nobody read the Constitution? Like, this is nuts. I mean, the reason I brought that all up yeah. is to say the way to understand what's going on in the bathroom controversy is that as uh, certain elements of the social justice left have been victorious on certain fronts, um, this is the newest battleground. And so this becomes an object of sort of sacredness and extreme devotion. So the way to understand all these moral movements is a kind of a, a crusade that binds people together. So I'm a Durkheimian. That means that I believe that Emil Durkheim, the sociologist, is the greatest social scientist who ever lived. And Durkheim taught us to see social action, social activities, often as efforts to create group solidarity to, to strengthen our team so that we can fight that team. And that, I think, is what's happening a lot on campus. A good moral and political movement needs a good, clear enemy. So you must, you must believe that the other side is really strong and is adamant against you and racism is everywhere, sexism is everywhere, transphobia is everywhere, homophobia is everywhere. So you need a good, solid enemy. And even though universities are the most anti-racist, anti-sexist <laughs> country, but it's an article of faith that they are institutionally racist, institutionally sexist. So it's it's an incoherent movement if you look at it from the outside, but psychologically it's 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 very standard sort of Manichaean us versus them religion because we evolved in small tribes. Uh, we evolved, uh, so the, one of the wisest dictums or cultural sayings is the Bedouin proverb, me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me, my brother and cousin against the stranger. So we're very good at making these recursive, like, you know, this group against that group. And so what's happening, uh, and we, I mean, we can get into this, this sort of the idea of victimhood culture. Yeah. Uh, what's happening is um, a kind of a moral movement on campus um, where uh, sort, of the, the, sort of the social justice left, and you find this on every campus, you find a group, they'll, they'll meet, they'll, they'll often take gender studies courses and intersectionality stuff, all that stuff. So you'll have a group, um, um, which is very much in an us versus them mindset. And everybody on every side thinks that they're the victim. That's what's so interesting here. Right. There, there is out there an appetite against political correctness, which is what you have described this as. In fact, your YouTube video is called Professor Against Political Correctness. Mm -hmm. But let's make sure we're all speaking the same language here. You would define that how? Political well, correctness. Well, I think it's a particular kind of ideological game. And I, I think the outcome is twofold. It's to make the player feel morally superior and also to take... Um, rather serious uh, axe swings at the foundation of society. And so the game is identify a domain of human endeavor, note that there's a distribution of success. Some people are doing comparatively better and some people are doing comparatively worse. Define those doing worse as victims. Define those doing better as perpetrators. Identify with the victims. Have yourself a, a set of enemies handy to vent your resentment on feel good about it, even though it didn't really require any work on your part, and then endlessly repeat. 
And that's why I've seen that happening on campuses in particular for the last 30 years. In your YouTube talk, you describe those who oppose you on this issue as, quote, resentful and uninformed. Yes. Tell me why you think that's accurate. Well, um, I worked for the NDP when I was a kid. I went from the time I was 14 to the time I was 18. I worked with Rachel Notley's father and, and her mother and, and knew them very well. And I actually found them very admirable people, as well as the other people in the, on the socialist end of the distribution who were genuinely working for, for the rights of working class people, coming out of that Saskatchewan tradition that established health care and pension and all of that. But I noted at the same time that the party functionaries, let's say, weren't that sort of person at all. They didn't really like the working class. They weren't standing up for them. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it until I read George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier, which is a brilliant book, and which was written for the Left Book Club in the UK, and he was talking about the failures of socialism in, in, in the United Kingdom and, and then discussed intellectual socialists of the type who didn't exactly like the poor. Okay. They just hated the rich. Resentful and uninformed, though. Yes, Speak well, the resentful part is, is, the, is the willingness to pull down any structure that's hierarchical because of resentment about not being on the top. And uninformed is, well, it's the it's the con consistent attempt to force every political issue into a single, in into the domain encompassed and viewed through this single lens. Jordan, so let's do one more question here and then we'll get everybody else into the conversation. You know, of course, that since this story broke, you've been called a lot of things. Yeah. Um, one of which is a transphobe. Yeah. Some people have accused you of um, using the free speech issue to mask what's really going on here, which is an attempt to deprive other people of what they believe are their legitimate rights. Well, I, and I want I to give you the opportunity to speak to whether or not you are a transphobe. Well, I can tell you that I've received more letters from transsexual people supporting me than opposing me. And I never said anything really about transsexual people, about their existence, although that was the first thing that I was accused of doing. I didn't say that transsexual people didn't exist. I said that gender identity, gender expression, and biological sex do not vary independently, which they don't. And so oh, this issue is in some sense only peripherally about, about transsexual issues. It's more centrally about gender issues. And then on top of that, and I think it's the biggest issue, is, is that it's a free speech issue. The transition that happened around 10,000 years ago when humans went from hunter-gatherers to, in the blink of an eye, just a few thousand years, we go from hunter-gatherers to Babylon and Tenochtitlan and other, other cities. This is almost instantaneous. How did that happen? And it's transformed the world, it's transformed the biosphere, the climate, everything. Uh, how did it happen? Well, as you see in these pictures, you, you do not get early civilization without temples. It just doesn't happen. You always have temples. Um, this is um, uh, an image of Muslims at prayer in Mecca. And so what I'm arguing here is that a really important part of our evolutionary history, this great trick that we developed, to use Dan Dennett's phrase, um, is the ability to forge a team by circling around sacred things. So in this case, it's a rock in Mecca. Um, and when we circle around, it's, it's, as low, it's as though you're taking a wire through a magnetic field, you're generating a current. I, I find um, metaphors of electricity really helpful for thinking about social life. Durkheim said this too. Um, as we circle around, it's like a current is generated which binds people together and allows them to do some, some real work, some social work. Um, so um, all religions do this to some extent, but it, it doesn't have to be religion. Um, nationalism is really a form of religion, psychologically speaking. Uh, you, have, you sacralize an object, and as you circle around it, then you can trust each other. You can, you can throw in your lot and work together. For, you can take great risks for, for uh, great glory. Uh, we wouldn't have politics if we didn't have this ability either. Now, um, an unfortunate side effect of doing this uh, is that when you circle around, you create this current, it, it, it separates good from evil. Or rather, we see the world that way. We, our vision is polarized. We look out at the world, our side is good, their side is evil. And once you do that, there can no longer be nuanced thinking. There can no longer be, well, they're right about this and wrong about that. You can't say that anymore. If you do, you're a traitor. They are wrong, they are completely wrong, they are wrong about everything. Um, and uh, just as a bit of foreshadowing, as you can see, this kind of thinking is radically incompatible with scientific thinking. Now, um, 
sacred objects uh, on the right and left. On the right, we tend to get the Bible and the flag, but on the left, uh, civil rights leaders, um, issues of, of so, well, social justice, uh, the environment. Um, each side will sacralize certain principles, and then they lose the ability to think critically about them. Uh, this is a coffee shop in New Paltz, New York. Again, uh, one foundation, uh, well, actually two foundations in this case, but basically uh, victims and oppression uh, care. Uh, so social justice, as I see it practiced, um, social justice, in the, at least in academic circles, is, a, I think, an effort to basically circle around specific identified victim groups, fight for justice for them, uh, demonize the powerful. So in this case, this is an American flag, and uh, well, this isn't working, but at any rate, American flag with the stars replaced with corporate logos. So America is bad, corporations are bad, the rich are bad, power is bad. At Occupy Wall Street, you do find a lot of talk about fairness, but it's fairness as a quality of outcomes mixed with compassion. So on the right, tax the wealthy, fair and square. Well, everybody's in favor of fair taxes, right and left. Everybody wants fair taxes. Uh, but on the left, um, it says on the bottom, how can they let us go hungry every day? So if there are hungry people, then taxes aren't fair. They should be higher on the rich to pay for food for the poor. That's what fair would be. You see that also here in this uh, cartoon created by uh, um, Craig, Craig Froll. Uh, equality to a conservative is Everybody has the same size box to stand on. And if you're too short to see over the fence, tough luck. But to a liberal, equality means you take the box from the guy who doesn't need it. He doesn't need all that extra box. Take it out of his box account and put it into that kid's box account. And now everybody can see over the fence. That is equality. Uh, now, on the right, this is, uh, this is deeply unfair. On the right, uh, these are uh, uh, signs from a Tea Party rally. Spread my work ethic, not my wealth, and stop punishing success. Uh, on the right, they often see the graduated income tax. The progressive income tax means the more successful you are, the more we tax you, the more you have to pay. That's a, pun that's a punishment for success. Uh, stop rewarding failure. Bailouts and welfare programs are ways to bail out those who otherwise should suffer the consequences of their failure. Um, and if the government protects people from that, then they simply won't learn and will get more and more of the bad behavior. Once we understand these differences in how people think about fairness, now we can see ways in which liberals do things that conservatives believe to be deeply unfair. So if you start by sacralizing victim groups, that's what binds your, group, your team together. Then you're gonna define fairness as the pursuit of group-based equality. You're going to want government programs to create more equality of outcomes by ethnic group. For example, race-based affirmative action is the preeminent one. Uh, you're going to ignore the Protestant work ethic, uh, and you're going to want to channel benefits to the poor um, uh, unconditionally. You're not going to want to do, you know, uh, prove that you've been trying to get a job. Just if you're poor, you should get, you should get some sort of uh, government support. Basically, if you know the ant and the grasshopper story from Aesop's fables, um, uh, the, the left seems to want to tax the ants to bail out the grasshoppers. That's the way conservatives see it. On crime and punishment, uh, liberals tend to side with the accused, focus on them as victims, and favor leniency. They want to repeal the law of karma. And I think Bill Clinton did a lot of work to bring the Democrats away from that. Uh, you know, he you know, allowed capital punishment, even in some questionable cases. I mean, he really tried to be, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to sort of end the Democrats' focus on, on, on criminals as victims. Uh, but I really want to really just call attention to this. This is, I think, the most important case of our time. This is a graph that shows the, uh, the achievement gap in students, in high school students. Um, the blue line shows the gap between uh, high income, uh, kids from a high income home and a low income home. So this is the achievement gap by class. And as you see, it's been rising rapidly from the 1940s through the year 2000, it's risen rapidly. Rich and poor didn't used to be so far apart, but now they're really far apart. The orange line shows the gap between black and white. Um, if you go back to the 1940s and 50s before Brown versus Board of Ed, it was big. Uh, and we've made a lot of progress. And as you see, around 1965, the two lines crossed. So the achievement gap by class is now much bigger than the achievement gap by race. But what does affirmative action do? Affirmative action is aimed at people like this. Uh, now, if the Obamas had never gone into politics, if you simply have two married lawyers and they have kids who are smart and go to a good school, that they are the kids that every top school is desperate to get. They get all kinds of lures and benefits. They're guaranteed admission. This is what affirmative action aims at, the children of black professionals above all. Uh, these kids are out of luck. They're born to a white single mother. 
affirmative action will not help them because they are not in a preferred victim class. So I was on a conference call back about five, six years ago. Remember, there were a bunch of ballot initiatives where states were banning affirmative action based on race. So on this conference call um, with a Democratic pollster and members of civil rights groups trying to workshop the language to defend race-based affirmative action, I finally had to say, you know, the reason why nobody has found that language, you know, you've got a lot of smart people in all the uh, political operative shops, the reason why nobody has found the language is because it can't be found. You cannot defend race-based affirmative action as a matter of fairness in America in this day and age. Um, um, to the extent that social justice persists in focusing on race rather than class, and class is the big issue of our time, um, they're out of touch. And frankly, I think it's unethical. If you like the video, smash that like button. If you don't like it, leave a comment explaining why. If you have nothing to add, zero, zero fucks, fucks given. given.